Uh, it's time at ten past eight to talk some rugby. Alan Quinlan, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are you? How are you keeping? Good, thanks. Yeah, very good. Your evening's viewing has been spoiled. And just to give people a bit of a sense, just a bit of a recap on events that have happened in relation to the uh, Leinster Montpellier match. So the Match Risk Assessment Committee of the EPCR and their independent virologists have met during the week. They reviewed all the information, uh, reports, Jerry Thornley saying at the show last night that Leinster had over 20 cases, uh, COVID positive cases, but were still proposing, and they said in a position to bring a squad of 23 players uh, to France who had been PCR and antigen tested and uh, results negative over the previous uh, few days, cleared by Public Health Ireland as well. So uh, the arms of the Irish government, plus uh, the reports from Leinster, essentially here, Quinny, been overridden by the EPCR. Yeah, it seems... Uh, it's, it's not a huge surprise that the game is off, I think, um, because obviously... Leinster had positive uh, from Wednesday's testing. They had um, positive cases in their camp. We don't know exactly. I know that um, Leinster had separated some groups. They were wearing masks in training. Um, seemed to be doing everything to get the game on. It seems initially when you when you look at it, it seems it's quite unfair because Montpellier had positive cases in the weekend. But I suppose significantly, they had no positive cases since Monday, since their results on Monday. So, um, yeah, it's very disappointing for Leinster and it could be costly for them in, in the end of this. I doubt it will be. Um, I think they'll they'll still beat Montpellier at home and Bath away, prob- most probably with bonus point wins. So, um, But just trying to get to, to be one of the top seeds could be tricky for them. And uh, they obviously released a statement saying they were very disappointed with that because they had a, a, a squad ready to go. And it seems it seems from the outside that it's unfair. Yeah. Does it create a game of poker now for does it create a precedent in terms of other teams now looking at this and maybe withholding information until as late as they possibly can to see the other side's hand first? It does possibly, yeah. I think look, we've got to be careful, Adrian, and I know Leinster are unhappy, but those medical people made these decisions and maybe <sighs> The obvious thing is here, they think that maybe some of these Leinster players that are in the match day 23 that they announced yesterday could potentially um, be positive cases and they may develop symptoms and in France. And um, I think that's what it's based on. Um, I, I, I looked at the, I thought about the Wasp game at the weekend when Wasp had cases on Saturday, announced on Sunday morning. Um, Potentially, those guys, again, we're speculating, most probably were in with the the Wasp players because there was four of them starting for, for Wasps. Um, one on the bench that pulled out and announced on Sunday morning that they were out of the squad for the Munster game. What's different there? Potentially, they could have effect, infected mm. um, the players that started. So I'm not sure why that's the case in that situation. Obviously, it's... <laughs> Again, we're, we're not privy to everything and all the medical reports, but this decision is based, I think, in, on Leinster having positive cases. And they had positive cases yesterday with their, their PCR testing on Wednesday. Um, so it, it, it potentially could set a precedent. Well, I think if I was Leinster and Montpellier, um, I would have been holding out and kept saying all weekend, we're playing the game, we want to play the game, because... You, you pull out early and you make mm. a decision to pull out early and, and not fulfil the fixture and that's what happens. But it happened to Leinster and uh, they're not pleased by it and um, maybe we'll hear more today on that. Yeah, I think that crystallises that viewpoint for clubs that were in any doubt about it before. Now, just one last point on it for me. The the turnaround now to the Interpros, Quinny, the turnaround to a couple of games in the middle of January and look at who knows where we're at at that point, but let's assume that they're all going ahead. Um, in terms of the disappointment and as described on the Indo this morning, fury on the Leinster side, which you can easily see, uh, the job of Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster now to ensure that that isn't something that's gnawing away at the squad, that it's like you kind of from that side have to park it pretty quickly. Yeah, I think they will have to. Um, they released a statement very, very quickly, Leinster, with their disappointment. So they are disappointed and they had a squad ready to go there. Um, and who knows, Adrian, if they went, maybe someone may have had become positive or may not. I think it was a roll of the dice, really. But it seems unfair that 
Um, it was awarded. The match was awarded to Montpellier. Um, a draw would have been probably the, in, from the outside looking in, the fairest result. So, but they've got to dust themselves down and just go again. And as I said, you know they've they've Montpellier at home, Bath away. They'll win both those games. You'd imagine with bonus points, so they'll get the fifteen points. Would it make them one of the top seeds, which could be crucial for a quarterfinal, semi-final, where where those games are on? It could well do do that. So. Uh, maybe we'll talk about this at the end of the season and look back on it again because I think Leinster were going to easily go four out of four in these these pool games. Um, but there's nothing they can do. They've just got to get on with it now and I hope, again, that everybody is okay who's had COVID yeah. in the Leinster camp and it just shows how volatile the whole situation is at the moment within sport as well. We haven't had a chance to talk to you yet about you've been talking to the Red 78 podcast but not to us just yet about the Munster situation and Johan van Grand's departure. Um, if you if you had been involved in a monster committee that were because it looks like they were offering him a new two year contract and he's turned it down in favour of going to Bath. If you were involved in the committee, how would you be advising about sort of pre all this being made? Like, have Mon- did Monster make progress under Johan van Gran? Um, it did. I think um, stability and young players coming through, and we've seen some performances. The progress we haven't seen is um, when you get to semi-finals and finals and performance there and whether anybody likes it or not that's where we've Munster we I say we <laughs> Munster everybody knows anyway <laughs> where my where, where, <laughs> no where, surprise where Quinny no surprise where I'm from yeah but look I haven't played for the club for 15 years yeah. I think it's I, I, it's there's always an inclination to say we um where, where they've got to and I think that that's the, probably the next step and maybe the attack uh, overall attack shape on a consistent basis and it's not about I've said this many times not about having um, this crazy approach where you throw the ball wide wide all the time it's just having that in their locker that you can take it out when you're chasing games and stuff like that and um, there's been disappointments with semi-finals in Europe not getting out of the pool stage two years ago, probably the Pro 14 or Pro 16 final last year. I think there's there's been kind of disappointments that um, obviously come to mind very, very quickly, but there's been some really big performances along the way and some 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 good rugby, I think. I think there's a lot of good foundations laid. Um, there's been a transitional period in the last two years with lots of, lots of young players and we've seen the the excitement of after last weekend so um chugging along when he was how Ronan Agara put it in the paper this morning uh not exactly flying it and it's probably be, that's probably one of the reasons maybe why Johan has made the decision that maybe his philosophy and his way of doing things um has brought him to this point where <sighs> I think when Damien Dialinda and RG Snyman signed two years ago, you think this is this is this could be the final gap to get him just a step ahead, a step into that final of Europe and, and, and a bit closer. And obviously RG Snyman has they've had no luck with him. He's had no luck himself as the play, as a player. Um and yeah, so I think I think that's that's what kind of Yon has probably felt himself on the outside. There is a frustration there and an impatience from Munster fans, and I suppose um, you know some of those performances in the big games are the ones people remember. Particularly, it's the end of the season, and it kind of wipes away the good work that's been done. But you know, Johan Van Grand kind of handed over the reins um, to, to Stephen Larkham some while ago, so. Um, if people are frustrated a little bit about the kicking and stuff, Stephen Larkin was to take take some blame for that as well. So um, I think there has been progress made. There's been stability there. There's a really good bond in the group. I think they're excited themselves, the players. And um, there is something building. Getting to the next level, the top level, is difficult for all teams. Um, but maybe there's an opportunity now and maybe it's good for both sides that, mm. that there is going to be a change and some some fresh ideas and some new ideas come in. That, that I makes... think it's really really important to say that Irish players love detail. They love structure. They love um, a coach that challenges them. So whoever comes in has to bring an organisational kind of real top-class organisation and detail for the players. 
And I think for this group in Munster, I think um, they need to improve their attack game, their overall attack and shape. And I think they have the capabilities. They're getting some good players coming through, exciting players that hopefully can express themselves more. Sorry, Owen, I know you wanted to ask one, and I'm sorry to cut across you. Um, Quiddy, all of that, what you've just said there in terms of the detail and all that makes me believe, I can't then come to the conclusion that Munster were going to offer him a two-year contract. Because, like, if, if a parting of the well, way is the right... Yeah, well, I think they obviously saw, Munster obviously saw this, and I think we have seen, um, <laughs> we have seen a shift in the way they're playing. We haven't seen it consistently, but we've seen, sometimes it is down to personnel as well, Adrian, you know what I mean? And it's not just in your back line, because they've had a decent back line for a couple of years now with, with Carberry, Dialinde, Farrell, Earls, Conway, Mike Haley, um, there's no one, like they're all attack-minded players who want to play with the ball in hand. Um, but I think that the issue is maybe getting the forwards uh, to be more expansive in, in their thinking and kind of stepping out of the Rassi era where they probably didn't have the same personnel and that there was kick pressure and it was def- being strong defensively, being really aggressive at the breakdown and putting pressure on the opposition. The, the way Rassi won a World Cup with, with South Africa... And it's very hard to kind of change players very quickly. And, and I think I even saw some, uh, some, some parts of even last Sunday's performance where you kind of revert to type a little bit, tuck the ball under the arm rather than looking for the space. And I, I mean that for the forwards. Um, so I think the opportunity is there to, 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 to build on that. And there's good foundations there. Chugging along what Rod said is probably... I'd say it's more than chugging along, but I think there's a frustration there that there's more in these players and that if Munster are going to lose semi-finals and finals, that they do so throwing caution to the wind when they're chasing a the game, if that makes sense. That, that makes them an, a very attractive proposition to coach though, Alan, because it's just that final bit of actually turning them into a team that win the big games. And in O'Gara's column this morning as well, he's wondering why someone of the calibre of Mark McCall hasn't been linked to the gig is he a potential candidate? I don't know if he's interested. I think um, there. Would you like to see him in? Would, is is he someone that you would like to see as a candidate? If he wasn't. In, I, I, play, I, I played with him um, with, with Ireland with Ireland A um, top class um, fella um, has done a brilliant job. It's it's pretty ruthless here when you're with the provinces. He didn't have the best of experiences in Ulster when he was there, but went 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 to the UK and has done a great job with Saracens. I think um, he's someone, of course, that could do the job and do it very well. Um, there's plenty of candidates and plenty of people like that. There's a number of, um, you know, Irish qualified coaches and that are abroad um, that could could seriously do a top job there. I think it's it just depends on um, who's going to steer the ship here now. Is there going to be a director of rugby and a head coach, and then? you know, filling in that assistant role underneath. Um, so I don't know what way they're, they're, it's going to go here, but someone like Declan Kidney, and I, I've said this as well, that, you know, a director rugby role for him would be, he'd be the ideal man for that job. But would he leave London Irish? Does he want to come back and do that role? Or does he want to be part of, of you know, coaching a team? So I don't know, there's they've some big decisions to make there. And Mark McCall is someone, of course, that would, if he was interested in the job, would be a serious candidate, given what he's done. They're, they're clearly already uh, putting the feelers out because O'Gara does say that he was that he got a courteous uh, phone call. Uh, so, so they're clearly making yeah. the, the, these calls at the... It was a courtesy the, call. I don't know how courteous it was. Oh, sorry, courtesy <laughs> call. My apologies. Yeah, we don't, know, we, we don't know the ins and outs of the, the actual phone call. But so, so they're clearly working away on this. So, like... It, does the idea of a director of rugby potentially limit your list of head coaches, Alan, or would most head coaches around the world be willing enough to, to work with a, a director of rugby, say if it was Declan Kidney? I think the job is 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 um, the job is a big job and there's a lot of work and a head coach coming in there trying to run um, be over overseeing everything that's going on, working with the clubs and monster, um, all that kind of stuff the school systems trying to implement um, continuity through the systems um, is is something that there's a lot of work for a head coach when he comes into that job. A director of rugby, 
would actually take the pressure off a head coach and let him focus on the team that's in hand that he's trying to work with the squad that he's trying to work with so um does it undermine him no in, in no way because any head coach who takes the job will want full control of his team and what he's doing with the team and i would imagine that if there was a director of rugby and again i don't know i heard talk a little while ago that 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 was something that monster were looking at because i think it's it's getting a continuity throughout the province and working with the clubs and we saw what happened last weekend and um the way the clubs kind of helped helped monster releasing players and stuff like that they were supportive of what monster were trying to do they were, they were in a really tough position and so i don't think it would hinder a head coach obviously um depends who you're bringing somebody and even for the assistant coach role of replacing Stephen Larkham, um, you just don't know who who who's going to come into the system and who they want to bring with them and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of moving parts. Quinny, Graham Roundtree is someone someone as I said who's who's there who may want to may be interested in in the head coach Good job shout. as well. If there was that director of rugby role, it would suit somebody like Paul O'Connell who wouldn't have the experience of the head coach side, but have somebody there then to take all that off him. Is he an an in play option? Do you think? I don't think he's. I think what Paul is doing, and and it's similar to to Ron, have known the both of them so well, and not speaking for them, but I would imagine that Paul now is focused on a project that he's doing and his work with the Irish forwards, and you know, you're two years out from a World Cup. Um, I think that that's something he's got his teeth stuck into, and has obviously had brilliant success what happened in November so mm. of course he could do the job and I uh, would inspire people around him but I think it's probably somebody who if if there's a director of rugby um, somebody who's been in the game a long time and has an experience of being a head coach and how systems work in different countries as well yeah this is an exciting next step for me as a coach and for my family in moving to a proud club and a true rugby city did you see that quote during the week from Van Gran? Um, I, I skimmed at the article to be honest um, I didn't get a chance and look once once once, I just thought the timing of it wasn't great the timing of it given, was there in the middle of the games Quinny but I, and I don't know if that I wouldn't expect that, that was I just don't know why Bat didn't wait for a couple of weeks and even, yes. even next week to make that announcement and, and just it just felt that it was too quick after um Yohan's announcement um, that they were out straight out the next day it was like it was the press release was ready and, and Yohan signed a contract over the summer and activated the six month clause so this 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 contract was signed he was signed up for two years he obviously has some sort of reservations frustrations himself um, and maybe he'll speak about them at the end of the season but um, Maybe it's a good thing for both sides that yeah. um, that there is going to be some change. I don't know. My dealings with Johan were very minimal in the last couple of years, but any time I met him, he seemed very nice, respectful. Um, the players <clears throat> liked him, but the timing of everything this week was um, would would irk people a little bit, I think, and uh, that's that's kind of putting it mildly. But it is what it is. They've just got to try and finish on a high, and I hope it doesn't affect the mentality of the players or the coaching staff. And that they give themselves a shot towards the end of the season to to with, with, to be challenging. Yeah, and we'll. Uh, I mean, I'm sure any new coaches that come in will be looking at the display last weekend and thinking this is not a bad not a bad gig to get. Let's talk about some of the other games that are uh, on this weekend as well. Want to mention um, <laughs> Ulster in action tonight and uh, Saints side that are cooking along nicely, albeit without Dan Bigger tonight. Yeah, they've just got to back it up. They were brilliant last weekend, Ulster and. Um, it's a big boost for him to have Ian Henderson back. I think um, a, a timely return for him. Um, Courtney Laws plays for Northampton tonight, but I just think this is it's a it's this is a kind of a potential banana skin for Ulster um, mentally and emotionally. Where they got to last week was was excellent. The character they showed, and uh, I hope they can just back it up now for Dan McFarland's sake and, and for the players themselves because. Um, it's been so up and down the last couple of years for a long time now with Ulster and um, the inconsistencies. Um, tonight necessarily isn't about this brilliant performance and scoring four tries and winning them with a bonus point, even though that's probably on the cards. I think they just got to they got to win tonight. They just got to get a result. 
um, and make sure that they, they, they don't slip up in any way because Northampton were poor, really poor last week against Racing and uh, I don't expect them to, to trouble Ulster unless Ulster are not right themselves. Um, they were superb last Saturday in Clermont. Yeah. And we mentioned last week about like Connacht's big challenge over these couple of weeks being to obviously get the win last weekend. I it uh, Sunday is a bit of a is it a shot to nothing, Quinny? Like it's a big ask, isn't it? Yeah, it is a big ask on Sunday against Leicester. Um, they 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 showed how gritty they've become now, Leicester. They were dreadful for years, um, really struggling in the Premiership, struggling in Europe as well. Um, they've turned that around. Steve Bartrick has done a great job there, and you know he's 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 developed a lot of young players that they brought through their own systems. There's some good overseas guys there. Um, George Ford, Ellis Genge leaving at the end of the season, so it's probably the norm in the Premiership that, and maybe that's why the people are a bit surprised this week and still getting their heads around Johan Van Gran and that the way it happens. And Johan is the same as a player. Um, I think coaches are the same. It's a ruthless business. If the if the shoe was on the other foot and he was getting the sack, um, so players, coaches, they look after themselves. And you look at Leicester. Ellis Genge announcing that he's leaving at the end of the season. George Ford. Um, that's probably the norm in the Premiership. But Leicester are a very strong side, and they won over in Bordeaux last week, which I thought Bordeaux would potentially be uh, could be a very dominant side in this competition. So it shows how tough they are. Um, but I just think Andy Friend's side when they play um, their confidence rises they, they they play superb rugby they attack teams and they're pretty brave the one area that you'd be concerned about is that physical confrontation and that they're going into a bit of a hotbed of, of um, an historic place in Welford Road so it, it can be very difficult for them or they can they can surprise us all here and, and do something special, which would be incredible. And I think they've developed and grown a lot, that group. And, um, you know, they were in the RDS a few weeks ago and they, they booked a trend there. So maybe they can do it over in Leicester on Sunday. Does last weekend potentially show us that Connacht have the game plan and the smarts to not allow that power up front to be to their detriment? Um, yes. Um, you can have all the plans in the world um, on, but sometimes it's just, it, it, there's nothing you can do with that. I think the small moments in this in these types of games are really important, and those physical encounters, you know, one-on-one -on -one tackles, uh, breakdown application, all that kind of stuff. Not letting Leicester um, get momentum in the game is really important, and just managing your way through it. And that's where Jack Carty is going to be really important: when to attack and when to put boot to ball. Um, that's going to be really important, but it's just kind of in them to attack and and to keep the ball alive. But they've just got to be careful because they have a very, very aggressive defence, Leicester. They've, scored, they've conceded the least amount of tries in the league this year, so they don't give away much. Um, so Connacht have got to find a way and, and be really physical and just intense in their application. And you, you couldn't rule Connacht out from scoring tries themselves and creating stuff, even though Leicester's defence, as I said, is very strong. But they've got to be smart with the way they play this game on Sunday. One before we let you away, Quinny, just in Bod, we trust on YouTube, was wondering if it's a good time to bring Flannery and Felix Jones back into the Irish system with Munster. Um, yeah, they, we ha they haven't been mentioned much this week. Um, they've obviously, they obviously were there and have left and have both have had great success. You know, Jerry's won Premiership with Quinns. Felix has won a World Cup with South Africa. So, um, Again, the timing of th those guys coming back, I don't know in the positions they're in, but you couldn't rule anything out mm. um, with, with, with one or, or two of them being in the conversation. I'm sure Munster, that'll come up in, in, in conversation. I don't know where all that's at. Um, they, they, with their, their departures, it's very recent. Um, and I'd be surprised if, if either of them were thinking of coming back, um, given where they're at and the teams they're involved in at the moment. But... It's something that's nothing that surprises anymore, I don't think. Yeah, true enough. Come on, enjoy the rugby over the weekend. Cheers, lads. Thanks. Alan Quinn, what's left of it at least.